A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. Listen for God's word. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul, shouting in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Someday, I want to do a sermon series on the book of Acts. The reason for this is pretty simple. Acts is filled with stories about the early church, the the church in just the first few years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Because of that, there is an awful lot to learn here about how the church was formed and grew, about the challenges that the church faced in those first formative days. But there is also a lot to learn here about the church today, about what it means to be a Christian today. 
And I think that's more than clear in today's lesson. Here we find Paul and Silas, along, by the way, with Timothy and Luke, is actually Luke is the one speaking here when he says we. We find them as they journey along on Paul, one of Paul's great missionary journeys. Now, I haven't been preaching from Acts lately, so it might be helpful to take a moment and sort of set the stage for what is happening in today's text. Let's start with our two leading characters. First of all, there's Paul. While he is well known to us today as the first great missionary of the Christian faith, not to mention the fact that he wrote a pretty big chunk of the New Testament, that's not how he started. He started out being one of the great enemies of the Christian faith. In fact, the book of Acts gets to the point where we discover that Paul has essentially made it his mission to wipe out Christianity. And he had gotten a pretty good start on doing that. When one day, while he was on the road to Damascus, he was going up there to persecute the church. Damascus was the leading city of what we would today call Syria. While Paul was on that journey, Jesus appeared to him in a vision and completely changed his life. After a period of soul searching, Paul reappeared. And from that point on, he set out to spread the Christian faith throughout the known world. Then there is Silas. We don't know as much about him as we do Paul, but we do know a little bit. He was probably a member of the church in Jerusalem and traveled along with Paul on some of his journeys. While there is some debate, many scholars believe that both Silas and Paul were probably Roman citizens. That was not that common that day, particularly in that part of the world. And that was a fact that made it easier for them to travel around. They had a little more freedom than a regular person would because they were Roman citizens. Well, so much for our characters. Now to the setting, the city of Philippi. Philippi was founded by Philip II of Macedonia in the 4th century B.C., but it didn't really become a, a super important city until the Romans took it over and built an important road through the area, and that road began to bring people from all over the place into Philippi. Much like the similar story with Ephesus, because of this travel, the city of Philippi began to blossom. And it became very cosmopolitan, very diverse, especially when it came to the question of religion. Just about every kind of faith that could be found in that part of the world found its way into Philippi. So, when Paul and Silas showed up and started preaching the Christian message, it was just one more voice in the middle of a cacophony of other religious messages. Now, things had been going pretty well for our missionaries here. They had even managed a few conversions, but then they made a crucial mistake. It seems, according to our text, that there was a certain slave girl there in Philippi who was possessed by what the text calls a spirit of divination. In other words, she was a fortune teller. And her abilities in this area had become well known. And since she was a slave, she had owners. And the owners were making a lot of money off of her fortune telling. Well, when she meets Paul and Silas, she knows right off that they are men of God. And so she starts following around and shouting out and telling this information, this information that they are men of God, to everyone they meet. And our text tells us that this really got on Paul's nerves. <laughs> it says it annoyed him quite a bit. So finally he turns around, having had enough, and he casts the spirit out of her so that she would stop following them around and yelling. We don't know 
what the girl thought about this. But we do know what her owners thought, and they were not happy at all. You see, they had been enjoying a nice, steady little income stream off of her from her fortune telling. And now that she could no longer tell fortunes, that stream had dried up. So, they had Paul and Silas hauled before the local authorities on some trumped up charges. They were stripped, beaten, and thrown into prison. So there they find themselves, chained up, their feet in stocks, and locked, the text tells us, in the innermost cell of the prison. Their situation appeared hopeless. The outlook was bleak. But right there in the middle of that, right when you would think that they would be tempted to give up, I know I would, we find them not giving up and instead praying and singing hymns in such a way that all the other prisoners were listening to them. But it was right there, right there at that moment when most of us would have given up, that God intervened and set them free. God released the chains that bound them and even gave them new converts to boot in the jailer and his family. Okay. So that is our text for today. But I said at the beginning of this sermon that one of the things I like so much about the book of Acts is that it has a lot to say to us Christians, we Christians today. So you may be wondering what a story about a possessed slave girl, two missionaries in a prison, that took place 2,000 years ago in a city halfway around the world could possibly have to do with all of us here today. I don't blame you if you're wondering that. But the answer is a lot. It has a lot to do with us. Especially if we realize that Paul and Silas and the other prisoners with them there in the jail weren't the only people in this story who were bound up with chains. There's a slave girl, of course. Her chains, her symbolic chains, were the spirit that had hold of her. Something that she probably didn't want and had never asked for. And because she had this evil spirit within her, her owners were using her every day. Milking every dime, nickel, and penny out of her that they possibly could. Then there's the owners themselves. Their chains had to do with greed. That's what was binding them. They couldn't see what they were doing to this girl. They couldn't see that they were using her, dehumanizing her, because they were bound by the chains of greed and profit and the bottom dollar. So bound were they by their greed that they were willing to make up charges and lie about two innocent men just to get revenge. Then we have the civic leaders, the judges, so to speak, in our text. Philippi, 
had a reputation to protect. It was a city that prided itself on its diversity, its cosmopolitan flair. So they had to squelch any voice that might be disruptive, that might upset the delicate social balance that they had worked so hard to build. So they readily accepted the charges against Paul and Silas. The leaders of Philippi were bound by the chains of maintaining the status quo. So, what about us? What are the chains that even now bind our lives? What are the chains that get in the way of our loving God and loving our neighbor? There are many, I suppose. Perhaps you are bound by the chains of anger. You find yourself lashing out at other people over the slightest little thing. The guy on the road cuts you off and it fills you with rage. Your boss is riding you and nobody else. That coworker that you can't stand is really getting on your nerves. And you finally had enough. Or perhaps this anger affects you a little bit differently. Perhaps you keep this anger bottled up inside until you get home and then you unleash it on your family or friends, innocent victims like Paul and Silas to another person's chains. Or maybe your chains are worry and anxiety. Maybe you are a person who is always worried about what could happen about what could go wrong. Always expecting the worst and never expecting the best. This kind of thinking also begins to bleed over into your relationships with other people and with God as well. You find it hard to have faith in other people because, you know, they're just going to let you down. They're not going to follow through. You've been burned by others more than once, and you don't want it to happen again. And because of this, you may even be finding it hard to have faith in God and in God's plan for you. Because, you know what? If everyone else is going to let me down, why should I believe that God won't? Maybe worry and anxiety are the chains binding your life. Or maybe you're like the slave girl in today's text and you are bound by other people's control on your life. You feel like you have no say on what happens to you, that your life is controlled by someone else, maybe your spouse or your parents or your children or friends, the people who are always trying to control everything thing you do you're caught in a in a spider web of relationships to the point that you're not even sure if there is a you at all anymore just just a shell of a person controlled by the wants and needs of everyone else this control that others have over you is the chain that's binding your life. Or maybe you're like the slave owners in this text, controlled by greed and profit, the need to get ahead, the need to have more, a nicer car, a bigger house, a better bank account, a better stock portfolio. The pursuit of the almighty dollar is a chain that binds many people today. 
There are others, of course. We don't have time to go through all of them. But there are other chains that bind many people today. Chains of addictions or depression or any number of other ones. And in the midst of this, we find that sometimes we bind ourselves and sometimes others bind us. However it is that we have come to be bound and understand all of us are bound in some way or another. My point today is this. God can break those chains. And God wants to break those chains. In 23 odd years of ministry, I have to tell you that often have found people who have reached the point where they are simply ready to give up. They think they have become a lost cause. So the best they can do is just go on day after day, dragging their chains along behind them until finally they are so worn out that they just can't take it anymore. Or else there are others that are completely blind to their chains. And everyone else can see what is binding their lives, but for some reason their, their own vision is clouded and they can't see themselves for their chains. So, what are we to do? Well, how about we try doing first what Paul and Silas did? Pray. Pray about the chains that are binding us. And I don't mean firing one up every once in a while. I mean sitting there in the presence of the God who made us and who saved us. And praying over and over and over without faltering and without giving up that our chains would be released. Pray to God and ask God to free you from what is binding your life, from what is chaining you down, from what is keeping you from having the kind of relationship with God and with other people that you seek. And when you pray, remember this. God is in the chain-breaking business. God is in the chain-breaking business. But let me add one more point. When God breaks chains... Well, God may not break chains in the way we are expecting or maybe even wanting. A lot of times people think something like this. Okay, God, I really need you to take care of this problem for me. Break this chain, in other words. And we do that and we expect God to do that in the way we want or we think we need. But look at today's text. How does God break the chains in today's text? By sending an earthquake. An earthquake so violent that it shakes the very foundation. I love that. I absolutely love that. <clears throat> I love the part about the earthquake because it reminds us that when God goes about chain breaking, 
God may very well need to shake us up a bit. God may need to shake the foundations that we have chosen for our lives in order to build new foundations, strong foundations, foundations that will stand firm when the storms of life, when the earthquakes of life, come at us. In fact, it may even be that sometimes God has to shake us up and tear down our foundations just to get us to realize that there are chains binding us at all. And you know what? That's okay. Frankly, Many of us who call ourselves Christians today, including myself, could stand a little shaking up. We could use an earthquake or maybe a life quake to shake us up and help us to look at our chains and see what is binding us down and holding us back from being the kind of people God is calling us to be. And if God has to shake us up a bit to help us see all that, well, that's all right with me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.